We are ferociously religious, and insofar as our existence amounts to the condemnation of everything that is known today, an inner necessity demands that we be equally unyielding. What we are starting is a war. This is Acid Horizon, and our episode on George Bataille and the notion of expenditure. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to Acid Horizon, the theory podcast. Our topic today is Georges Bataille's 1933 essay, The Notion of Expenditure, which can be found in the collection of Bataille's essays, Visions of Excess. This episode has been in the works for a few months, in fact, but I'm glad we waited because since planning this episode, I have had numerous sporadic encounters with this material and surrounding texts of Bataille's all of which I hope we'll get into some of today. Starting off, one of the primary claims Bataille makes, one connected to his interest in the cultural anthropology of Marcel Moss, Emile Durkheim, and others, is that the primary driver of the construction of societies and social dynamics is and has been what he calls the notion of expenditure, the idea that various forms of non-productive excess and the destruction of property undergird social relations and, to some extent, precede or inform the utilitarian forms of exchange that occur within a society. In terms of things that we've looked at on this show, this essay is a little bit on the shorter side, so that gives us the opportunity to go through it step by step, more or less. And I'd like to start out by gathering up everyone's impressions, starting with Adam and Will. So, Adam, what did you think of the text? Yeah, um, this is my first sort of deep dive into Bataille that wasn't, you know, the story of the eye or the, some of the more esoteric papers from, from the Asafar collection. And this, this is something that really sort of cleared it up for me because this sort of sums up how Bataille thinks about the economics of matter and not just uh, in the more immediate sense of society or even just on this planet, but in a very cosmic sense, even to the level of of, of, of the, the literal sum, which is always expending energy in this unconditional way. And I think, yeah, there's, um, there are some parts of this reading in which I do think the expenditure is doing a bit more work than it needs to be in terms of taking on aspects of production, which Bataille holds back for a very sort of conservative notion of production, simply you know, what is socially utilizable, what is social utility. But overall, I think this is a pretty much the best introduction you can get to Bataille. And I think especially in how he conceives of the sacred uh, really cuts at the heart of what you get in the asphalt papers and even to an extent the kinds of metaphors he's using in stuff like Story of the Eye. And how about you, Will? Yeah, um, same. This is my first engagement with Bataille outside of uh, Story of the Eye. And Bataille haunts so much of like the work that I read. Um, but what's fantastic about this essay in particular um, is the sort of creation of waste is something that I'm going to, to focus on, um, particularly as it relates to sacrifice as being the creation of a sacrificial item or entity. Um, I think sometimes with Bataille, there's like a one-sided uh, interpretation of... Uh, processes of utility as being like purely through expen uh, purely through expenditure or loss as such sort of loss proper but I want to sort of see the other side of that process as maybe being one that is fundamentally productive and maybe that's what we'll get into today great as for me the first Bataille text I ever looked at was the first volume of the accursed share I picked it up after finishing my master's thesis as a way to sort of cleanse the palate and I did it as a kind of speed run, I didn't really take notes on it, but it was very striking to me because the notion of expenditure is something that runs through the entirety of that book, of course. And it's arguable that this notion of expenditure is operative behind all of Bataille's texts after he developed this essay. But in fact, the very first place I encountered the notion of expenditure wasn't in the work of Bataille himself. It was actually in the work of Deleuze and Gattari in Antiedipus, especially in the first chapter where they talk about the body without organs yeah, exactly. and the concept of the production of anti-production. And as I understand it, the French volume of Antiedipus contains a fairly lengthy footnote 
or acknowledgement to the fact that the concept of the production of anti-production is something that Deleuze and Gattari owe to the work of Bataille in virtue of reading his notion of expenditure. If you listen to our very first episode about the body without organs, I go into the notion of the body without organs actually being this kind of non-productive attitude that conditions all production in a productive milieu. And to be completely fair, Deleuze and Gattari use the concept of a body without organs in a much more expansive way than Bataille does in his notion of expenditure. For example, the concept of a body without organs lends itself more aptly to talking about individuals, small groups, organizations, and so forth, as well as talking about economies and economies of scale and so on. I think it's also important to understand the genealogy of this concept. Like I said, Bataille is using Marcel Moss, he's using the cultural anthropology of the time to talk about how debt, for example, functions in a society, how obligation functions through rituals and customs of destructive expenditure. And I think it's important to note that the role of the creditor-debtor relationship as important to the construction of social relations and, more broadly, the structuring of desire is something that both Bataille and Deleuze and Gattari get from Nietzsche. And you can look at Deleuze's essay, To Have Done With Judgment, which is on to have done with the judgment of God, of Artaud. He also talks about Kafka in that essay. And I think all of those writings can give us a sense why authors like Bataille and Moss and Deleuze and Gattari found these exchangist conceptions of anthropology as being insufficient to describe the entirety of social phenomena that happen in any given society. In any case, I hope we get to most or all of this today. And I want to somewhat demonstrate why I think Deleuze and Gattari's view is kind of an improvement upon Bataille's notion of expenditure in some ways. But maybe what we can do first is talk about the history of this text and Bataille in terms of his association with the groups ASAFEL and the College of Sociology. And so maybe, Adam, you can start us off by giving us a very brief vignette of the context in which Bataille and his cohort was writing. So, yeah, I mean, so Asafel, well, to take the precursor to Asafel, it's definitely something that's born out of uh, Bataille's disaffection with sort of uh, orthodox, the orthodoxies of Marxism, uh, Leninism at the time in France, as well as particularly his break with uh, the Surrealists and uh, André Breton. And I think, yeah, there's a sort of free-headed or free headless beast that you would get with with uh, Asafel. You have the, the magazine, which is Asafel. You have its public. Well, no. You have Asafal, you have, as the magazine, you have the Asafal Secret Society, and you have Asafal's public um, persona, which is the College of Sociology. And I think the main thing that all of these different people are operating with, whether it is you know, Kosovsky, or it is Kawa, or it is Masson, it is the, the idea of the sacred and this idea of the base. And this very sort of transgressive guttural conception of, of material life in a way that is not quite so much Marxian, although it is undoubtedly revolutionary, but thoroughly Nietzschean in how its materialism goes for, and especially Dionysian, not just in sort of Nietzsche's sense, but also in the sense of studies of Dionysus that were sort of contemporary at the time. So, for example, Walter Otto, his book on Dionysus, is actually there are actually segments of it in the, the Asafal papers, the papers of the magazine, not the Secret Society. And this actually puts him at a distance from uh, fingers like Deleuze were to use Nietzsche in this way, because even though we might see there are some ways that Deleuze and also Guattari have built on Bataille, uh, Walter Otto's Dionys- Dionysianism is really something that uh, Deleuze re- really can't, thinks is quite a castrated Dionysus, one that doesn't really quite fit in with the, the ecstasies of Return and Return as he sees it, though the figure of ecstasy I think will come up quite a lot as we go through Bataille here. I have some questions about the circles that Bataille himself uh, rolled in. Um, like I, I know that where where was where was Bataille when it when it came to uh, sort of the post Jungian or the Jungian schools of psychoanalysis at this time? Um, because you know he makes sort of passive references to psychoanalysis in here, uh, but they're not the sort of references that you would see in. Uh, 
someone in sort of the Adlerian school, the way that he's seeing the psychoanalytic relationship between the subject and like even like the ascertained object is like to me not one that's reliant on like archetypes or reliant on sort of a Freudian conception. Like there's an intensity here that like one could pr probably posit in relationship to Freud, but it's not like his his references to to psychoanalysis sometimes confuse me in this paper for that reason. Yeah, I'm I'm not entirely sure. I mean, in this paper the thing that he's riffing off the hardest is definitely the work of Marcel Moss and maybe to a certain extent, yeah. uh, Emile Durkheim. And then always functioning in the background is Nietzsche. One of the prerogatives of SFL was to take the, the leftism of that time off the track of Marxism somewhat and place it firmly on the track of Nietzsche. Yeah. Okay. I think I'm ready to jump okay. back in then. <laughs> Um, well, let's go into the first part of this essay, which is the insufficiency of the classical principle of utility, uh, or what I've called classical conceptions of utilitarianism. He might even use that term, too. And the one thing that Bataille is raging against is that when we're talking about utilitarianism, we're typically talking about what is maximally utilitarian, meaning the basis of our ethics revolves around finding out which is most useful or most pleasurable to us. And of course, there are hierarchies of usefulness and what is most pleasurable and so on. And if you remember philosophy or ethics 101, when we're confronting utilitarian arguments, there are some garden variety objections that we can go to when confronting its main premises. And Bataille has his own take on this, which is very non-standard from a philosophical standpoint. One of the claims of some utilitarians that Bataille is going after is that utilitarian activity is motivated at the top by things like honor, duty, glory, recognition, and those virtues. And moreover, the utilitarian has to make an account of where base pleasures fit into this whole utilitarian schema. Yeah, John Stuart Mill sort of comes in to say, you know, these are the base pleasures. And then we have these sort of more aristocratic <laughs> sort of uh, pursuits of man. Mill is a, yeah, he's definitely under fire here. One for his, you know, quite, he's quite a paternalistic thinker in that sense, especially when it comes to his notably colonial and disgusting foreign policy. But even in, in basis, yeah, as you say, base and higher pleasures, there is, is there really a less. Italian or even less Nietzschean motto than that of John Stuart Mill's when it comes to pleasure, which is, you know, better to be Socrates dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. Right. You know, you, you don't actually want to be a clam, Jeremy Bentham, he says, wagging his finger. That's sort of the, under, the undergraduate understanding. But like, he's directly under fire here uh, in this paper, um, at least in, in the way that I, that I understand uh, how he's going to be sort of approaching um, this sort of gap in utilitarian thinking. Um, and I, one thing that uh, Bataille says is that the, the, the sort of this gap is, is extraordinarily prominent in utilitarian conceptions of society, and it constantly forces us to return to these, like, what, a, what actually is, like, pleasure as it relates to things like honor and duty um, and shit like that. Uh, and I, I think that's when this essay starts to, sh to, to establish itself as, um, as finding a way to insert Nietzsche there uh, beyond sort of the fundamental like aristocratic understanding of beyond good and evil and the genealogy. One of the things that I became very interested in when I first encountered this essay, and I still haven't made good on it, is the distinction that Bataille draws right off the bat between a notion of honor, duty, and glory, and all of these qualities or characteristics associated with recognition, the inversion of those things being something like secrecy, imperceptibility, the ability to avoid a gaze, that is going to be part of the foundation, I think, of his ethics. And I think that's something to keep in mind as we move forward. Another thing that I'm very interested in in this text that just comes at you in the first paragraph is the attack on utilitarianism. I mean, utilitarianism has to make an account of why it is some people seem to gravitate towards doing painful things over and over again, right? That's one of the things that uh, it typically 
doesn't fend off pretty easily. And especially as you get more granular in your description, I think it, utilitarianism tends to have a hard time with some of those objections. One of the th ways that Bataille addresses this, or at least one of the things kind of lurking in the background, is the Nietzschean notion of the tragic mode of existence, where pleasure and pain end up on the same side of the same existential delineation. That our enlivenment as human being requires that we are capable of accepting the highest highs and the lowest lows. And so this means acknowledging the inherent connection between pleasure and pain. These are just two things that I'd like to keep in mind. If I were a grad student or you know, if I wanted to do a paper on this, those are two things that I would kind of like be looking at as mm. I move forward. If we're going to take this back to the, sort of the technical terms that he's using when he's criticizing utilitarianism, he's talking about, well, mainly sort of, not even, not even necessarily just utilitarianism, but the sense of economic utility can it can see it off only in terms of you know, the, category, the categories of uh, production, acquisition, and conservation, you know. And the way he talks about how these categories are applied and how they are recognized, they are seen as rational, has the hint or the latent anti edipalism of being associated with the gaze of the father. It's talking, you know, because he associates the rationality of, you know, we must do productive things in order to acquire things and conserve uh, as, as many things it requires to keep production going, keep the energy of society circulating in a very uh, utilitarian kind of way. And where he's getting to this is that really it's just sort of the sort of paternal prohibition on another kind of economic activity, another kind of motion of the economic and a kind of motion of, of energy. And that is for him expenditure, which is something that, you know, the father may prohibit sort of the, the whims and the, the irrational sort of spats and uh, tantrums of, of the son. But really, his prohibition doesn't actually get rid of them. These are still integral to the relationship in the way they always kind of escape this even if you try and punish them. So there's a sense of escape that cannot quite ever be eliminated. And this escape is expenditure. It's the not simply expenditure in the sense of productivity and you know, product, the sort of expenditure of energy you need to conserve society, the expenditure of energy you need to do to keep producing and to acquire things, but simply the base level of expenditure itself, which is completely un unconditional and unavoidable. And you know, the, the most basic thing for in the foot father son relationship that Bataille will try to tease out, or just you know, actually, you know, just bluntly fucking say, is that your, you know, the father will never be able to stop his son mm. from shitting. <laughs> there is always going to be right. this unconditional flow of just absolute waste <laughs> coming from this relationship. And, you know, Bataille's lesson is everybody poops. And, you know, <laughs> That's true. On, on a cosmic level. <laughs> and for Bataille, the one thing that he notes in conjunction with that is, is that all endeavors like art, artistic expression, um, or even just lounging around the house, hanging out, sexual debauchery. They're, they're given a subsidiary role in relation to production. And one of the implicit suggestions in Bataille's ethics is that in order to transgress upon these systems, those are the vectors that we have to chase. We're moving into art. We're moving into sexual debauchery. Well, too, like, you know, I'm reminded of the way in which, like, uh, you know, this would be later, but like Theodore Adorno and Horkheimer used sod, uh, you know, in in the dialectic of enlightenment as sort of being a fundamental critique of post enlightenment instrumental rationality. And I think one of the things too is like Bataille explicitly states that like the formulations upon which like we sociologically the, the formulations of our of our sociological organization, the, or at least the way we perceive them, has to be one that, in principle, excludes non-productive expenditure in order to always be sort of in conjunction with a more utilitarian understanding of societal processes. Like it, it has to, out of principle, just exclude them. Which is why you're right; it needs to sort of put sexual debauchery, whatever, in in a sort of subsidiary role to what we understand as like productivity. And and I, I'm glad that Adam touched on the metaphor of the father-son thing that, that Bataille brings up. I think it's actually more than a metaphor. I mean, there is a metaphorical aspect to it too. It, it's interesting to think that there's this dyadic relationship between father and son that's uh, constituted by what? The necessity of a certain kind of production that's also then constituted by this 
mutual resentment shared by both of them. On the side of the father, Bataille uses the words, a partial malevolent solicitude. I just love that turn of the phrase. I actually used it in one of the tracks that I created for one of the EPs I released during the pandemic. And uh, I just thought that was interesting that the father, he's in, in the sort of tableau that Bataille sets up. He's pushing the son along like, I got to make this little piece of shit into a productive member of society. But here he is always going off track and I have to serve his needs. The son, in some aspect, reluctantly receives that care. The son accepts and even requires the solicitude of the father, but does so maybe lackadaisically or reluctantly. And so there is this sort of implicit tension there. But I think we can open the metaphor up if we look at it from a Deleuze and Guattari perspective, because what is it that situates this disjunction of roles, father and son? To me, it's something bigger. It's, uh, it, it's something within the society itself. It's the body without organs in which any father-son relationship exists within, whether it's, whether it's a father-son relationship in a feudalistic society or a society under capitalism. That is to say that the father-son relationship under any given set of social relations is not a universal one. At, at some level, the role between father and son has transformed over time. And I think the interesting thing is that the exigencies of what happens in the family between father and son is pushed by something else. And in, in uh, Deleuze and Gattari in the 20th century and the 21st century, that's going to be the exigencies of capitalism, market imperatives are going to shape the way that relationship and that tension evolves. I mean, yeah, going back to the sort of, yeah, the idea that the father, some relationship is always sort of territorialized in different ways. I mean, you always have the idea um, of, of collective father, the idea that sort of all the men of the village are a children's exactly. father. They, it can be dispersed across, across bodies. And I think there's something, yeah, maybe I think Bataille could have considered this a bit more given he's quite uh, in conversation with a lot of anthropology at the time, as, as false as it was at the time, obviously. But yeah, this is definitely something I think Deleuze Guattari sort of bring out in its more sort of explosive, more publicity. Yeah. Okay, so maybe we'll kind of move on to the principle of loss section. The important thing in this text is this notion of non-productive expenditure. The idea that a principle of loss is what undergirds all the relations of society including society under capitalism. And each society has a form of non-productive expenditure that is peculiar to it. And um, I don't know, um, Adam, what did you have on that? He's using, at least if you're coming to this from, if, if you've been following this podcast for a while, you know we talk about a lot of Deleuze Guattari. Maybe if you're a bit acquainted with it, you would understand, you'd, it would seem a bit weird because he's talking about unproductive expenditure. you know, And he's talking about stuff like jewels, you know, conspicuous consumption. Jewels, cults, uh, competitive games, all things that require, they're all social modes of losing products or losing energy. Losing and wasting energy, in a sense, produces something which is not integral, at least in Bataille's terms, to the rep reproduction of society. So, you know, cults sacrifice food to the gods, which they could actually eat. They could sacrifice the people to the gods, because they could actually integrate in their society. Here's a nice quote. The functional character of jewels requires their immense material value and alone explains the inconsequence of the most beautiful imitations, which are very nearly useless. Jewels represent the part of oneself destined for sacrifice. Much like shit. Shitting is <laughs> unconditional. <laughs> in the, it's simply unconditional in the same way that jewels value seems unconditional. I mean, if you, if you know anything about the fucking disgusting cartel that runs jewels, you know, it's differently. But the sense of a total waste of time. In a very conservative, it's a very waste of time and money. It even sees this in a sense of art. Right. And and, and the important thing, uh, I mean, Jules is just one version of this non-productive expenditure. If we look back through history, if we look back anthropologically, the important thing is is that this this notion of non-productive expenditure changes over time. So in, in some societies, this took the form of the potlatch, right, in a lot of pre-modern societies. And, and there's actually different versions of the potlatch. Bataille's work, or at least this essay, doesn't constitute an exhaustive list of them. But in one version of the potlatch, the goal is to actually out-gift someone else who would then, in virtue of accepting that gift, be socially humiliated and maybe even lose their social ranking. And Bataille touches upon the fact that there were somewhat extreme forms of this. For example... 
that in in front of your social rival, you would execute X number of slaves, for example. And so you would lose all the utilitarian value of having, I don't know, eight to 10 slaves or how many ever slaves you had. But the upshot is an increase in your own social standing, even though you could have used those resources to benefit your society in some other way. Right. Well, I guess like the, the, in the same way too, like, and maybe a Maybe I'll, we'll, we'll pin this for, for later. This reminds me a little bit of uh, the general formula for capital, right? Like that transition from, uh, you know, liquid cash to commodity then to liquid cash prime, right? There is only loss at the end of, of the laborer. But what, what, what's interesting to, to me here is like, yes, it's, it's a, like yes, like a sports game or like the stabbing of an animal on an altar is loss in a sense that like that animal had like immediate utility, right? You could get meat or milk or whatever from the animal, but it was the production of a sacred thing, right? But before yeah. then, it's a vulgar cow, a vulgar pig, or what have you. But once it's sort of transcended that that boundary into the sacred, it is a completely new entity. And I'm just wondering, wh- how does that transition happen for Bataille? What what is what how how is that like? How does the pig arrogate this this sense of sacred being? Well, for for Bataille, I think just to build on the idea of the sacrifice and the sacred. I mean, honestly, this one page of Visions of Excess, page one one nine, <laughs> the second bullet point on the cults and the sacred. It's it's the gateway to explain to explaining everything that he does with the Asafal and and onwards, because it's with this that he puts really not even a very anthropologically convincing notion of the sacrifice, but a very incredibly ferociously materialistic version of the sacred that inverts the entire um, the entire sort of topology or hierarchy of sacredness. Because what is sacred typically we think of as sacrifice is that. The thing sacrificed is elevated to a transcendental realm. You know, its its essence is of now of the gods. It is now for the gods. But for Bataille, this sacrifice is inverted because what is sacred about this is the material fact that it is sort of no longer there, that it is set aside. And this inversion is what carries on throughout the entirety of the Asafal papers. You know, um, the project of Asafal, its public form, as as you know, as, as Roger Carwas put it in the Winter Wind is to conduct this sort of transgressive, ultra-transgressive societal expenditure that hyper-sacredizes everything. The notion of ex- excessive expenditure, sacred everything, because there is a constant state of loss, of exertion, of what he, what Kalawa also calls intoxication. Intoxication in the sense of you have lost a uh, sort of rationality. You have lost sort of productivity. You've simply become ecstatic outside of yourself. You have lost yourself in this intoxication. And this is something that Bataille wants to sort of, and and Kawa and everyone else in Asafal wants to kind of expand societally. This idea that societal loss, societal loss of oneself, societal intoxication in a very sort of connective rather than individual way it's what can take us into this sort of new phase of, of humanity where everything becomes so good because it's always being lost and expended upon and transgressed and intoxicated. And I think this is the real sort of point at which he's trying to take it, to invert sort of the head of the world and take it down you know, this labyrinth of the mind, if you look at the figure of the Asafel, which is headless, and move it down this complexity into its guts. <laughs> its guts are a labyrinth. And its its genitals are ahead. It's this site of transgression, the site of total genital expenditure, the discharge, the filth, new human beings. It's it's all here. And one of the things that's important for Bataille and isn't as explicit here, but is very explicit in the text Theory of Religion, especially when it comes to animal sacrifice, is that the event of sacrifice, the function of it is to do something that is otherwise impossible in the utilitarian realm of humanity, which is to approximate this connection or intimacy with the imminent flow of animal life from which human life has sprung, but is now completely disconnected from and can only approximate it through rituals of expenditure. And there's a very brief portion, I'm looking at page 39 of Theory of Religion, where he talks about 
how the act or the ritual of sacrifice changes our relationship with an animal. He says, but to kill the animal and alter it as one pleases is not merely to change into a thing that which doubtless was not a thing from a start. It is to define the animal as a thing beforehand. So one of the things uh, in becoming human, one of the things that makes us distinct from other animals in the animal realm is our ability to render from the earth tools and make them useful to us. And for Bataille in his phenomenology, that ability to render tools from the earth is significant of this fact that we have permanently departed from this imminent flow. And just another quick portion from page 40 in Theory of Religion, Bataille goes on to say that, and the spirit is so closely linked to the body as a thing that the body never ceases to be haunted it is never a thing except virtually, so much so that if death reduces it to the condition of a thing, the spirit is more present than ever. The body that has betrayed it reveals it more clearly than when it served it. So in the moment where one lifts the knife over the, the, the animal on the altar, we do have this brief rupture with the phenomenal dimension of being human. And once again, we get this chance to, to move ever so asymptotically close to the imminent flow of life in the act of sacrifice. The imminent flow of life is, is something cosmological. It's, it's, it's literally the sun. You know, it's, it is constantly expending energy. The universe is constantly expending energy to the extent to which its own expenditure is actually accelerating. He wouldn't have known this at the time, but this fits into it quite, quite well. So you actually tap into the imminent flow of life in the same way that life is always imminently flowing out uh, exp expenditure, expressing itself in ways that aren't necessarily productive to the you know, the head of reason of, of utility. I wouldn't say, it was, I would actually disagree with you, Craig, a little bit, say that it's not impossible in the utilitarian realm. It is. It's just criminal. Mm. That's the thing that Bataille is trying to take us on. I want more explanation as to how like religious processes, particularly dogma, don't have direct utility. I think there would be some pushback just outside of the realm of like radical theory to say actually like these processes as political dogma do have direct utility. Like pastoral power is constantly reaffirmed. Um, let's say for for the thoroughly converted, right? These things do have immediate utility, right? In that they in that they reconstitute a relation. I guess I guess you touched on it when it when it came to to the return to a space where they where like humans post uh, acquiring sort of a I'll put rationality in scare quotes. This goes back to the sort of problem Deleuze and Guattari bring up with Bataille, which I think is ultimately right. In which why why is Bataille ceding the notion of production to the utilitarian conception of economics? Because I mean, Bataille uh, is, is automatically sort of taken on in the first few pages of Anti Oedipus when they talk about the case of Judge Schreiber. Judge Schreiber has sunbeams in his ass. He feels something. Something is produced. There is actually production there. It may be an excess. It may not. It may be a crime in the face of one's father. To, to, you know, in the, the father of utilitarianism. But there is there is production here, and it is it does have meaningful. There is meaning produced. There are connections being made. Yeah, so it, so it comes really down to whether or not you you buy the Bataille's sociological conception of utility. Mm. And I guess I'm still struggling to do that. Maybe it's because my Bataille is backloaded through Deleuze and Foucault. But like, I see so much theoretical humanism in Bataille, right? That. I struggle with these notions that there isn't actually an immediacy of utility, like an immediately uh, comprehensible utility in these processes. That in fact that they they are just purely destructive. So to answer your question, Will, you know this is one of those questions that you would get in the philosophy one hundred and one class uh, about utilitarianism. You know, to what extent is something no longer useful, or can we characterize it as something other than useful? I think Bataille gives us his example recalling the theory of Moss. And, and I'll just read that paragraph and, and I'll try to unpack it as best as I can. He says, the consequences in the realm of acquisition are only the unwanted result, at least to the extent that the drives that govern the operation have remained primitive of a process oriented in the opposite direction. And so Bataille says, the ideal indicates Moss and this is actually Moss's quote, would be to give a potlatch and not have it returned. This ideal is realized in certain forms of destruction to which custom allows no possible response. 
And so I think we can stop there and just say that built into the sort of ideological religious structure of society is this ideal notion of a complete non-reciprocal form of destruction or loss. What does that take the form of in the average citizen in society? It becomes a transcendent ideal of sorts. It becomes a virtue of the gods, perhaps, right? And that in and of itself doesn't have any utilitarian value except to say that this is the sort of ideological operator in society that then structures all other forms of utilitarian action within a society. So it's purely non-sumptuary production, as he puts it. Right. Okay. Yeah, I think I think that makes sense. I think that's a better way of looking at this transition out of... Um, and in fact, it's very Nietzschean, too. Um, but I guess, too, when we talk about sort of transitions away, he makes a distinction between... Uh, non-sumptuary production of an aristocratic elite in a particular period of history and the non-sumptuary uh, production of, let's say, like the post-industrial bourgeoisie. And I'm wondering if we can touch on that a little bit too, because I think that's helpful contextualization. Yeah, definitely. I think the important thing to realize is, is that once market imperatives are the primary operator in a society, everything changes for expenditure. And I think, Adam, you wanted to get in there with that. Yeah, so if you want to think about uh, sort of the aristocratic mode of, of expenditure, I guess, uh, one of the ways in which he ties this back to potluck is the idea of expenditure having, or wealth, exactly, for example, having an obligation built in. So potluck is, the obligation is, you know, in that, in that sort of competition is to, you receive it, the obligation is to give more back. And so there's an obligation as well in, aristocratic society, which has gradually eroded, given its Christianity, into the idea of wealth becomes an obligation not to wide society as a necessary uh, distribution, but in the sense of uh, charitable, voluntary arms. It can be, uh, you know, and that's a little clout boost. And I think this builds up a bit, in, as, insofar as Bartai sees it, into the bourgeois um, man, mode of expenditure in which, actually, the bourgeois mode of expenditure is just a one-class spending all for itself. And it spends for itself in a kind of very self-reflexive way to enjoy itself in its own class interests, in its own expenditure, in a way it's actually cut off from the rest of society. However, the way that he does, the way that the bourgeois does this, so eventually you know, they get hooked on it. They sort of go again and again and again to expend more and more. But in order to expend this more, they need to produce more. And because the bourgeois mode of production is so extractive and takes so much out of the working class, because the more you need to produce to do to expenditures, you know, the more diamonds you need, more people need to mine them, the more intense the mining is. And so this destitution has a de sort of inverse correlational relationship with the expenditure the bourgeois class can produce. Actually, it's, yeah, it's, it's the more destitute the, the proletarians, the greater the expenditure of the bourgeois class. Now, where Bataille's analysis gets a little bit fl flat for me is where he sort of tries to explain philanthropy. Because he goes, okay, yes, we do have philanthropy, but that's because... He, you know, he says the bourgeois class are too cowardly to sort of look upon the weight of what they've done. And he sort of thinks, okay, eventually you can only destitute the proletarians so much. So eventually this kind of this pleasure just kind of levels itself out. And occasionally for their political interest, the bourgeoisie might, you know, expend a little bit on philanthropy to keep, you know, things roughly going in this kind of neutral day state. But the destitution of the proletarians stays there and there is this latent, even in their destitution, there's this latent potency for an even greater expenditure coming from this proletarian class. And that is a social expenditure, which is revolution, which is sort of unconditional, pure, I guess, maybe, maybe I'm not sure if it's resentment, but definitely in terms of the hatred of their destitution. No, I, I don't think it's resentment because mm. I, I don't think he's going to be looking at class struggle in the same way Nietzsche would look at the bourgeoisie overthrowing the aristocracy in France, the Ancien Regime. Like, I think there's a difference because I think to Bataille, the very notion of class struggle itself is actually expenditure. And that's actually where I find something fascinating in Bataille. Um, I, I think it's the final, the final sentence of the, of the, uh, of the section is that uh, class struggle is like the grandest form of, of expenditure. Uh, it's because it must always perpetually threaten the existence of like a master class, but it can never like it only through like it can never actually threaten it until it reaches the point of like 
pure war, um, which I guess would be um, something that has to be added as sort of in alignment with like the master's brutality. And then I think that's when the transference of the tendency to destroy goes across the boundary to the proletarian masses. Yeah, and I think this force of, it, of excess is in in social evolution is seen as something that's very Dionysian in the Asafar project, because it's it, Dionysian in the sense of people become intoxicated by the thought of excess and conducting this excess. I want to go to a, a quote from the Dionysian virtues from the Asafar page, I think issue two, but it's all, and it's talking about the marginalization of the Dionysian cult, which is typically rejected in Roman society in favor of more sort of stable cults, but it has an inherent social aspect to it. And I think this social aspect of marginalization shines through much more in the proletarian condition than it does in the feudal condition, because there was at least more parish arms to an extent. You know, there was, you know, there was less destitution in the sense you all, everyone had a sort of land they were given to tend for their lord. But let, let me just go to the quote. So, what was once marginal, with all the appealing discredit associated with that expression, became p- a part of the new order, and in some way, the point on which it turns. The asocial, or what had seemed to be so, Focus collective energies, crystallizing and setting them in motion, and hence became a force of super socialization. The social aspect, the connectivity of this boundless excess of social revolution becomes imminently more possible in the fast ways of destitution that happens in, in the proletarian consciousness. In that sense, this Dionysian sort of excess, this intoxication of revolution becomes something that the Asafar guys call virtuous because it is connective. It's not like a separate kind of excess that is cruel in the in the, in the individual sense of the the in which you know cruel individual acts of cruelty separate people this sort of excesses of cruelty separate people the connective excess the expenditure of energy which says i i, I want the entire social orders to change you know as but we must become completely different or cease to be at all is at the heart of this cl- project of class struggle which he's outlining in this essay the one interesting thing where he talks about class struggle is that uh, he says that class struggle is prefigured in the agonism that you see in the potlatch ceremony. I think that's interesting because then once um, capital is instituted as the primary driver of the economy, then it takes up that agonism and, and reconfigures it in in a really um, you know radical way. But then he goes on his his kind of complaint about the bourgeois or what he indicts them on is their cowardice for ameliorating the plight of workers and the failure of the capitalist to admit to the destructiveness of capital. Looking at capitalists today, I actually think many smart capitalists are going to admit to the destructiveness of capital, except maybe, you know, in a television interview, right? And I think it's less cowardice and just more necessity on the part of yeah. the, the capitalists in order to keep capital moving. You know, these are the you know, this is the way that we keep the motor greased. And I think it's trivial to test the capitalists to see if they maintain the courage of their convictions. Of course, they're going to still be capitalists. I think that's absolutely right. I think that's brilliant in the sense that like at Davos, right? Like they're saying, oh, everyone there, like everyone there at Davos is like, yeah, we need a UBI. Like it's untenable. Right. We, need, we need like the, no, like in a sense too, like, Ah, like in a sense, Bataille's biting his own Nietzscheanism there as well, that mm-hmm. it like comes out of cowardice. Like, no, it comes out of like a really, really like understanding of the servile position. Like it's almost pernicious, but in a sense that like you don't blame those uh, in power for acting the way that they do in the same way that like Marx will always sort of go in at the bourgeoisie as hard as possible, but then at the same time sort of look at it in sort of a sickening awe, you know, that capital will always work with all its might to reorient itself around whatever the new uh, the new system of production is based on what, like, the legislative limitations put on capital in England in the 19th century are. Um, you know, so I think you're right in that he he misses the mark a little bit, but I do think it's like utterly fascinating that his formulation is one that is sort of outside the fundamental Marxist. Uh, but but now we, we have a capitalist who, we, we, have, we have an example of capitalist, one of my famous people on the planet in terms of capitalism, who is an example par excellence of pure expenditure. We have a capitalist who made their money family-wise extracting jewels. We have a capitalist who made their fortune on top of that, 
purely making a, a platform for people to process expenditures. We have a capitalist who makes most of his money selling off energy credits to other companies so that they can expend more toxic gases. We have a capitalist who goes on to spew shit on Twitter all the time, who says we will coo whoever he wants and doesn't care who hears it at Davos or behind any club closed doors. We have Elon Musk, who is a being from whom expenditure just flows. In The man is a living anus. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he sends cars out into fucking oh space for God's sake. He sends he's just expending out of the planet. Like the guy is pure expenditure. I don't think Batai could have you know understood this. I mean it's, it's individual, so it's not Dionysian. But the, the man is constantly flowing expenditure. I think one of the things that perhaps I should have mentioned earlier in the discussion, um, and Batai touches on this, is that the middle class, if there is such a thing, or the labor aristocracy, or just workers who have money, are able to live the lives of the bourgeois or of the capitalists in miniature in terms of expenditure. But to an extent, under capitalism, we all kind of do that anyway. One of the things right. that Bataille says is that the bourgeois, basically, the form of expenditure is very constrained. It's only happening within the, the confines of their class with their class peers. And the form of expenditure is never going to involve a complete compromise of their bottom line. And that's what happens to us as workers. We're watching our bottom line. The kinds of things that we indulge in uh, happen at a very either individualistic or atomistic level. It happens just with our, our friends, our family, our urban enclaves, or what have you. And one of the things that we're forced to admit is that capitalism has created a productive milieu mm. that now forces us to use all of its products and commodities not only to produce wages for ourselves, but also to produce our communities, too. So one of the products of capital is the continued entrenchment of ourselves as workers, laborers, what have you, into the world of commodity production, the production of information, and so on. And that, that's what we talked about in our Heart and Negri episode a little bit, too. Huh, it is for this reason that, like, subsequent, uh, you know, Marxist, or I guess not Marxist, but, like, insurrectionary groups or authors like... Uh, Tikkun, the Invisible Committee, have sort of a deep hatred of the middle class. Right. Um, and almost like as much of a hatred of like workerism that you see in like contemporary Marxist circles of like the quote unquote anti-woke left or whatever the fuck they call themselves. Like, because to, to these groups that are trying to reformulate or rekindle a sort of SFL style uh, orientation around the capacity for liberation, uh, the middle class plays a sort of role in making revolution increasingly impossible. Right. You know, libidinal economy shows us that. Um, the very end of DNG's anti Oedipus tries to show us a little bit of that. Um, it's this capacity for like, that capital has to allow certain groups to buy into it, the petite bourgeois, you know? So there, there is sort of this hatred of like it, within Marxist circles of like uh, those who do not fall into the economic categories. Like Marx has a sort of contempt throughout the first volume of capital for the rabble a little bit. Mm. Um, one that I think Bataille will find ill-founded um, and one that, Tukun and the Invisible Committee finds like deeply stupid mm. <laughs> because it's that inability to to fall into uh, economic structures, the being unemployable, being ungovernable, that uh, completely rejecting the this act of rejection, which is in this essay, is one that has uh, an emancipatory capacity, but like. Once you're subject to like apparatuses of capture, it becomes increasingly impossible. Yeah, I think that's one of the important elements of not only Bataille's thought, but of the SFL group itself, is that they were trying to discover for themselves a way to live life well and escape the apparatuses of capture of capitalism and fascism, religion and so forth. And I think that it's important to note that Bataille and others in SFL, in conjunction with their use of Nietzsche, 
They believed that ethics wasn't always pegged to politics. That is to say that the political isn't always commensurate with life with a capital L. And this is in part because that societies impose certain kinds of constraints that repress the Dionysian forces. Every society that has ever existed on the planet, our society today, always has some element to it that it must repress or exclude in order to maintain its cohesion. And this is one of the things that they were trying to get at. And this is articulated pretty clearly in Kaiwa's essay, The Dionysian Virtues. And one of the things that he suggests there is that there is a form of life that transcends history, race, localities, and languages. And so I'll just go ahead and actually read that quote. Here's how Kaiwa understands the Dionysian. He says, It follows from this general discussion that we may now employ the term Dionysian virtues, with virtue to be understood as something that connects, and vice as something that brings about separation. These virtues were sufficient in themselves to enable a collectivity to create its emotional foundation and to establish the solidarity of its members on these virtues alone while excluding any prior affiliations based on locality, history, race, or language. This would affirm, for those drawn to them, the conviction that these virtues were unfairly mistreated in a society that chose not to recognize them and which did not know how to suppress them. So too, to give them a taste and show how they might group themselves together in an organic formation that was irreducible and resistant to assimilation. And finally, to strengthen their resolve to adopt this strategy, which is always available. This is to say that for Kaiwa, Bataille, and the rest of Asafel, they held the belief, just like Nietzsche, that, that any society in history has been and always will be insufficient to valorize Dionysian virtues in their fullest. Societies are always going to exclude something. And so the ethical praxis or the kind of line of flight that the members of ASAFEL are interested in involves making this intentional break with social forces. Is this the outside? You know, the outside in the sense that I think Deleuze Guattari sometimes talk about the outside in the same way as they think of, you know, an outside to the state of a, a, a global church. Is, 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 is this an attempt to try and make a, a global new religion which won't ossify itself in the same way that the Catholicism does? Is, it, you know, is, is Asafel trying to create this new Dionysian, hyper-social, hyper-sacred religion, which is anti-individualist in the sense that you know, Kawa says in uh, The Winter Wind from the College of Sociology that they are doing the opposite of Sterner. Mm. They are making everything sacred. And is this an attempt to sort of, you know, George Bataille's body sort of becomes part of this in the sense that he was rumoured to be, um, there are other people said to be sacrifices, that this is meant to be the sacrifice that shows what a body can do. Mm, you know? right. It shows that a body can found this new community because the, 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 the sacrifice is willing, everyone else is willing, the sacrifice is a communal transgression that starts you know, a new kind of sociality that they want to spread throughout the world. Is, is this an attempt to reach the outside? I don't know. I, like, uh, not not in this particular as. I mean, I guess like Craig will have a better answer, but I want to jump in because of this notion of the outside. I think is one that I str struggle with when it comes to like formulations of politics and in French theory. Because, like, I think part of the reason why Bataille is fundamental is that it allows for the notion of creating subjects, which is crucial to Deleuze, Guattari, Foucault, Leotard, and so on. Um, and like, I, I think it's not necessarily about reaching an outside, but it's about like rejecting like the factory of citizenry, right? Like it, it's about refusing uh, sort of the concepts of the spectacle and, and sort of trying to, to thwart off docility um, by looking at what presupposes and makes bodies uh, presupposed to those technologies, but I, Craig probably has a better answer. Yeah, I'm I'm conflicted on this. I mean, it's a big question. I, when I think of the outside, my go-to with Deleuze and Gattari is the notion of fabulation, that the authorship of the future involves a kind of creativity in which we herald a new people or a new earth. These people are always absent in the present political milieu but there can be intimations of what this future might look like 
within the present at any given moment. Going once again back to what is philosophy, pages 99 to 102, right? Like, like we always talk about. <laughs> I think there's a great example of this concept at work, whether it knows it or not, in the film Blade Runner 2049. And I'm a little bit hazy on the details because I saw it so long ago, but the story of the film centers around the notion of a child who was born of one of the replicants. And if I remember correctly, these new forms of replicants bore with them the possibility of a new politics that was emerging. And I'm kind of fuzzy on some of the details since I saw it so long ago, but Adam, I know you know this film pretty well. So the society they were trying to make a Blade Runner 2049 is, that it, it's not ever heralded, but it, the idea is that there's the chosen, a sort of a chosen one. This is a person who is um, the son of a human and a replicant. Sorry, the daughter, sorry. That's right. Spoilers, but right. Yeah. Of a human and replicant. And she is actually the person who is, due to some condition, has to stay in this bubble all the time. But what they do is, is they're the programmer who makes the dreams and the false memories or just you know, the memories of the replicants when they're created. Right. It is the Dreamweaver. But I don't know if that's... I mean, when I think of that and Deleuze and Kataria, sometimes I do think if you're caught in the dream of the other, you're fucked. Well, what really led me to make the connection between Fabulation and Blade Runner was that at the end of the film, they indicate that there's going to be a dawning of a new era for the, the replicants, and they themselves are going to enjoy a freedom and autonomy that they previously could not. And the form of political struggle that's taking place in the context of the film is setting up the conditions for the possibility of this freedom and autonomy to be enjoyed. Yeah, but it, but in the same way that, that that's the case, like Qatari saying that individuals who, who reject inclusion, right, like in the 21st, in what would be the coming 21st century, those are the ones that will be targeted specifically by these same... Like, so... It's like, I, I just don't understand how, okay, so is it the programming that's revolutionary for the for the, for the the replicants, I guess would be my question? I mean, it's the machinery of dreams that gives them the sort of subject, that gives them the personal history. Gives It's it's the method of subject, subjectification, and this, maje- this, this new method of subjectification is coming from this new being, this fusion being that sort of breaks down the territories of, you know, the born and the, un, you know, the born and the creators. And I think what's right. interesting as well is that one of the ways that replicants sort of hide themselves from these forces is they have their eyes changed or removed entirely. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and the important thing is, is that throughout the entirety of this film, that figure is repressed. Right. And so that's what, and that's what led me to bring in the concept of fabulation, because in any given political struggle, there is the kernel of the possibility of the future and in some sense, I, I kind of saw that film as being analogous to that. We, we should do we should do a film series. We should do like... Wait, sorry, are we, are we keeping the 2049 stuff? <laughs> I can barely do philosophy, uh, film criticism. <laughs> Let's see. So maybe we can just finish up the discussion talking about the section on Christianity and revolution. Uh, Adam, I know this is always a topic that interests you. So why don't you uh, go to the piece that we talked about earlier? Yes, yeah, so, uh, let's start off with a quote. So... Um... From page 127, if you've got your visions of access with you, it's uh, the meaning of Christianity is given in the development of the delirious consequences of the expenditure of classes and a mental agonistic orgy practiced at the expense of the real struggle. It wallows in a revolting impurity that is indispensable to its its ecstatic torment. So Christianity is a religion founded upon loss. Mm. You know, it's the loss of Christ. It is the becoming sacred of Christ through his expenditure. And I think there's a slightly niche, well, no, not slightly, very niche. Yeah, very niche. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. The expenditure of classes is repressing Christianity because they sort of enjoy their destitution and the expenditure of it in the way that this, beca- this is something sacred for them, but something isn't properly challenging to the revolution, to the class order in the revolutionary sense. There is something latently revolutionary to it, uh, you know. Uh, as Fatai says, you know, it's a tropic character of such movements accounts for the total human value of the workers' revolution, a revolution capable of exerting a force of attraction as strong as the force that directs sinful organisms towards the sun. And this is something that he sees in Christianity. There is a tropic, literally in the sense of a plant phototropism, of bending towards the light, bending towards this flow of excess coming from the sun that is unconditional, that happens in Christianity. Mm. Because especially in the act of communion, Christ is sort of reinstantiated in, in the host, if you're if you're um, Catholic at least, and he is consumed. He is born and dies again. 
in the holy community. This is also something that happens with Protestantism and sort of being bought up, dying and rising God in every community. There is a latent Dionysianism to this, and this is something that Nietzsche finds in Christianity, although something corrupted in St. Paul. I mean, he's very pro-Christ in the Antichrist. The Antichrist should not be called the Antichrist, it should be called the Anti-Paul. And I think there's even quite a nice... <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, it's, I, always, I was reading this, I was thinking a little bit about uh, the, the letter, I've mentioned it in the podcast before, that Hegel sent to an educational minister when he said that to worship um, the host as having the real body of Christ in it, the actual substance of God in it, to worship this biscuit as God is to equally to worship the rat shit it becomes later. And But Ty, but Ty looks at that and thinks, actually... He, in his incredibly base materialism of this materialism of baseness, uh, this he it's very it's very provocative. It's meant to be transgressive in its action. That's why it's not entirely bloody accurate. But this is here. Mm. There is this worship of excess, which is not seen really in terms of. It, there is a communal aspect, but it, it's never really quite coming out there because the revolution is always infinitely delayed because the revolution is simply the judgment. Of, of of hell, it's you know it's it's Aquinas talking about one of the pleasures of heaven is to look down at the sufferers uh, below. You know it's um I, I don't I, Nietzsche you know Nietzsche says you know the the the, the sign above hell in, in Dante's Inferno could be rewritten because in Dante's Inferno the sign above hell says I, I too was made by eternal love. Nietzsche says well, at least in Rick Roderick's paraphrasing of him. It's in his you know, beautiful South Texas ways, you know, I too was created by eternal hatred. Mm. And there is a sort of a line of flight in Christianity that tends towards excess, that tends towards this Lord of Light, this expenditure, this God that does kenosis, who gives himself into the filth of life, is born in between, you know, uh, is, is born for in like the mess and the stank, and as Corner West calls it, the funk of life. Yeah. And there is this tending towards excess that I think he's trying to reformulate in these revolutionary terms. Anything else on that? Uh, I'll just jump in. Yeah, the, my big takeaway from this section, it, it's actually pretty simple. I mean, when you when you look at this, it's almost like you're reading the genealogy of morals just in a condensed form, right? And I think it's interesting, rather than using the concept of ideology from Marx, Bataille uses this more Nietzschean concept to say that, you know, religion, it doesn't seek to eradicate suffering from the world. In fact, what it does is it rewires the circuitry of society in such a way to nurture the material divisions by being able to say that the, the capitalists, the, the bourgeoisie, that they are the bad ones. And if they're bad, well, then I'm one of the good ones. And it's this construction of this Manichaean apparatus in the ethics of the society that keeps the motor of capital turning. Hey, thanks for making it to the end of the episode. And thank you to all the patrons who have been supporting us and even those people who aren't patrons but are still doing things like retweeting episodes and just generally giving us a shout out. Also, thank you if you bought one of the t-shirts from our merch store. That really helps us out too. We have plenty of new episodes in the works. Our next episode is going to be on Plato. We have perspective episodes on Gatari again, on Deleuze again, on a Fondane, which will be an interesting one, an existential thinker who is not often talked about. Uh, but anyway, if you want to stay connected, subscribe wherever you're listening, and then we will see you on our next episode. Okay, take care.